and one of those institutions was the University of Maryland. And I would like to invite up to the stage a friend and a great supporter of SPS and Sigma Phi Sigma and a member, Steve Rolston from University of Maryland Physics Department. Thank you, Brad. Um, so on behalf of the University of Maryland, it's delighted to see all of you here. It's nice to have conferences post pandemic and actually see people, not Zoom screens. Um, so, you know, the University of Maryland has had a very active SPS chapter for many years. Um, I'll do a little embarrassment. Uh, last year's winner of the Outstanding Advisor is our own Donna Hammer, who's sitting there and now scowling at me for making. <laughs> <laughs> and that just goes to show how important SPS is to a, a good physics department. And I'd also like to have a shout out to all my Maryland colleagues, scientists who I see sitting here, including retired faculty members, staff members, adjunct faculty. So it's, it's really delighting that we can be so supportive being so close by. And I can't be up here without giving a uh, sales pitch for the University of Maryland graduate program. So we have about 275 graduate students. We have an entering class of somewhere between 40 and 50 students every year. Um, we do all kinds of physics, um, from the highest energy to the lowest energy, from TV down to nano Kelvin. Lots of opportunities. As you've seen, DC area is a very vibrant area and we're located just on the edge of DC. And besides being right next to the seat of government, we're also nearby many national laboratories, including the Naval Research Lab, Army Research Lab, NASA Goddard, uh, NIST. And let me just make one last highlight. So. Uh, Liz earlier mentioned the Nobel Prize, so the Nobel Prize awarded this week was for quantum information entanglement, John Clauser, Ellen Espe, and Anton Zeilinger. And I think this is just a good example of how exciting physics is. Physics is an old science, but there's still a lot going on. So the work they did, um, understanding quantum information and entanglement, is at the heart of all the hype and explosion going on in quantum information science, quantum computing, networking, um, quantum sensing. And that's something that we do in conjunction with our partner at NIST through the Joint Quantum Institute. So there's another great example of cutting edge physics. Um, and it's fun to see that some of the ideas that essentially the Nobel Prize was awarded for the founders of quantum mechanics in the 20s would have understood it, but they didn't really understand the implications. And what's happened over the last hundred years is we now have the capability to take individual atoms and put them in entangled states and the like. So it's just a great example of what's going on in the world of physics. Um, maybe the other big thing we should think about is that most of the universe, we don't even really know what it is. It's kind of embarrassing in a way, dark energy, dark matter. What we see is just a little tiny piece. So physics is mature, but there's still a lot going on. So I encourage all the students to continue with your studies. And you know, if you wanna come visit us at the University of Maryland, feel free. And so have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. And as an alumni of the University of Maryland College Park, I can say it is a really awesome place to be. Um, I'd now like to do, uh, as is tradition at these events, we always have students introduce our plenary speakers because this is the Society of Physics. And this so the society is for? And we want to hear from the? Excellent. OK, so I'm going to invite up Aiden from Zone 5. If you're in Zone 5, give a shout out. Come on up. Hey, y'all. Boy, there are a couple of y'all here today, aren't there? All right. So, hi, everyone. 
Uh, like Brad said, my name is Aiden Keeveny. I am the SPS Associate Zone Counselor for North and South Carolina. So this summer I was also an American Institute of Physics John Mather Policy Intern, where I had the honor of serving in the office of Congressman Bill Foster, who is the third PhD physicist elected to Congress. And today I have the honor to introduce to all of you the second. Rush Holt Jr. was born in the fall of 1948 to mother Helen and father Rush Sr. He graduated with a BS in physics from Carleton College in 1970 and an MS and PhD in physics from NYU in 1981. Dr. Holt was active in the physics research community for more than a decade, where his research focused primarily on plasma physics while also dedicating himself to science policy, communication, and education. He is also, by the way, the only human that I am aware of to beat IBM Watson in Jeopardy. <laughs> Dr. Holt became Congressman Holt in 1999, representing the 12th District of New Jersey until uh, 2015. While in Congress, Congressman Holt advocated for reproductive rights, expanding access to affordable health care, environmental preservation, small businesses, and education. After Congress, Congressman Holt became the CEO of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science and the executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals until his retirement in 2019. In his retirement, he has continued to advocate for building a stronger relationship between the scientific community, government, and the general public. At the end of my SPS summer internship, I was gifted a book called Science, the Endless Frontier, which included a companion essay from Congressman Holt. In it, he writes about the need to bring scientific thinking into the public sphere in order to meet our biggest challenges, environmental protection, energy generation, healthcare delivery, and even democratic voting procedures and equipment. Congressman Holt has been a leading voice for science advocacy and policy for decades. And as the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated, we need the lessons he has learned now more than ever. It brings me great pleasure to introduce to all of you, Congressman Rush Holt, Jr. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, I come here having studied in Zone 11, I guess it is, and taught in Zones 1 and 2. So uh, I'm a big fan of SBS. Um, and uh, I just saw my friend Jack Hine, who for many years, for many years now, has been the, the kingpin of the uh, Association of Physics Teachers. And I'm pleased to say that although I've been out of the classroom, the physics classroom, for 40 years, I guess, they still saw fit to make me a lifetime member of the AAPT, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> um, uh, this is not going to be your usual physics talk about new developments in, in a physics subfield or an exploration uh, or explanation of a physics principle. Uh, it's really about the place of physics, your physics, and science in general in our society. I'm just really impressed uh, with how successful this uh, FizCon is. You know, 1,250 of you from two or 300 institutions, um, and obviously very much engaged. And that's what I want to see. I want to see physicists engaged not just with each other, with other physicists, but engaged with society at large. We need you. So that's what I'll be talking about. When I started in physics, I wasn't sure that I had the makings of a physicist, but I knew I wanted to try. I was interested in everything in school, but physics more than anything. I stuck with it, and eventually, I said to myself, hey, I'm doing it. I'm actually a physicist doing physics. I majored, I went on to graduate school, did research, taught, and then one thing leading to another. I started doing various things, more teaching, more research, business, administration, public policy and diplomacy, and electoral politics. From my earliest memories, I've been interested in how things work and how people get along. That's science and politics. 
I never saw any incompatibility there. Many scientists do, many politicians do. They wouldn't want to have anything to do with the other. How short-sighted that is. I combine my love of physics with what I would call an outgoing personality, an interest in helping people, an interest in using words as well as equations to express ideas, always trying to become a better communicator, and an ambition to do important things. I'm not totally retired now and here to reminisce, no. Um, the organizers of FizzCon have asked me to find in my varied career, or I would call checkered career, some experiences that might be relevant to you looking forward. The title for the talk, Physics Beyond Physics, come from the I comes from the idea. Physics Beyond Physics is, is what I've given uh, for the title. And the idea is that learning is what remains after you've forgotten everything you've been taught. Well, for physics, what's left, I think, is the habits of mind, the thinking like a physicist. I think physics and science are important in our lives, our society, our politics, far beyond the laboratory, the observatory, the computer, and the classroom. And I want to ask you to devote some attention, at least, during your career to applications of physics to public issues. There are many ways to do that. I also want to point out that the greatest public contribution you can make is to continually show people that the scientific way of thinking is as much for non-scientists as scientists. The bumper sticker that started appearing around central New Jersey during my seven campaigns for re-election to the House of Representatives read, my congressman is a rocket scientist, Rush Holt. A great bumper sticker, but not completely accurate. It's true that I was a congressman representing the people of central New Jersey in Washington for 16 years, but by background, I'm an astrophysicist, a plasma physicist, not a rocket scientist, whatever that is. Oh. <laughs> Uh, the meaning of the slogan, though, for me, maybe two meanings. Science counts everywhere. And once a physicist, always a physicist. <laughs> Having stud studied physics at Carleton College and NYU, taught physics at Swarthmore, done research there and at NCAR in Boulder and at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Wherever I worked, I always brought my physics perspective. Whether at the US State Department as an intelligence analyst of nuclear weapons proliferation, as a congressional staff member, and that was as an APS congressional fellow. You heard Liz talking about that, and it's great to be here with Liz, by the way. Um, you know, after you have your PhD, sometime in your career, you might think about being a APS congressional fellow. But wherever it was at the Department of State or on Capitol Hill, or as a, you know, even as a member of Congress, or the CEO and executive publisher of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest general science membership organization, I drew on my physics background although I hardly used the specific knowledge of spectroscopy or solar structure or double diffusive convection or plasma stability or magnetohydrodynamics and so forth, I thought like a physicist out of habit. Like Einstein and other physicists whom we extol, and unlike many non-physicists, I believe the universe is comprehensible. Now, by that, I'm, I include physical, social, and biological reality. One must find the right way to frame the problems, find the right intellectual, experimental, and mathematical tools to collect and analyze unbiased evidence. And if you do that, humans can approach comprehension of the universe, making sense of the world. 
Now, one must always have the humility to recognize that there's more than simply physics to understanding, and there are always unknown unknowns, and there, there are a lot of other modifications I might put on this, but scientific evidence beats ungrounded opinion every time. In the fifth grade was when I learned that inertia was a concept that had been described by scientists and that Newton had described motions with laws that could be expressed in equations. I was excited. I knew I wanted to study physics. Later, I was shown mathematical analogies that the same equations can be used to describe a system of springs or acoustic vibrations or voltage in LRC circuits. They were all metaphors for each other. I love to think about physics, and I love to learn how physicists thought about things. I was delighted when I read two anecdotes that Einstein told. One was how, as a small child, he puzzled over how a compass needle could know where the Earth's magnet was and how it could feel the magnetic force. And two, as a teenager, a teenage Einstein puzzled over what he would see if he held a mirror and ran at the speed of light. More about that anecdote later. I like to know what is behind the appearances, how things work. There was a poem by Walt Whitman that I never liked. <laughs> when I heard, it's, it's entitled, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. And he says, that the charts and figures the astronomer presented made him sick and tired, and he had to go out and look at the stars in silence. Well, I love to look at a dazzling night sky, but I love it even more when I can consider the structure and evolution to be inferred from the variety of stars, and when I can puzzle over the missing mass in cosmological calculations. In college, I learned there are a number of good reasons to study physics. Physics is beautiful philosophically, mathematically, aesthetically. Physics combined with other scientific knowledge advances our culture and civilization. Physics is useful, even practical, in meeting basic human needs, energy, travel, shelter, and more. My favorite college professor, the late Mike Casper at Carleton College, not only taught me quantum mechanics, but also showed me that a number of prominent physicists then were devoting attention to strategic arms control, that is, trying to control the nuclear arms race between the US and the Russian USSR. Physicists, some physicists anyway, felt they had an obligation to solve the problems that their profession had largely created, nuclear bombs, ICBMs, and so forth. They understood the physical capabilities and limitations of the weapons, and they were willing to try to think clearly about the problems. I saw the strengths in thinking like a physicist. Now, any experienced physicist, she, he, or they, when confronted with any problems, not just physics problems, will probably try to analyze it objectively by identifying the various interacting factors the relative strengths of the interacting factors, by seeking some general principles that might be governing the interactions, identifying the bias introduced by each of the various actors into the framing of the problem, and figuring possible ways of reducing those biases. Physicists are likely to approach the problem openly, presenting their proposed ideas tentatively to others to be critiqued. The physicists will not be deterred by technical terms or probabilistic and statistical reasoning. They're very comfortable considering actions on very different time scales simultaneously. I could go on at length about what I mean by thinking like a physicist. And I would also add some modifications some about departures from the ideal here. 
But I could go on at length about the ways physicists and other scientists are trained to approach problems and usually do. AAAS had a program, you heard it from Liz, uh, for about half a century now to place dozens of scientists in congressional offices each year. I was one once, you should consider it. In my congressional office each year when I was a member, I tried to have at least one AAAS congressional fellow. They did great work on a variety of legislative topics. They thought like scientists. And by the way, it was kind of nice to have somebody around the office who knew what I was talking about when I would use a phrase like impedance matching. <laughs> scientists more or less follow the traditional ways of science and the ways of scientific thinking have turned out to be very productive since the 17th century at least. Very productive in understanding how things are and how things work. Now notice I'm beginning to broaden my scope and I'm talking about science and scientists in general, not just physicists. Now of course scientists and <laughs> certainly physicists can be pig-headed and biased and mistaken and certainly not all scientists think alike. But there is, I think, a common way of scientific thinking, an effective way of thinking, that asks questions so they can be answered empirically and verifiably, so that the scientists will seek verification of their ideas in the larger scientific community. And this thinking is the best path to reliable knowledge about th how things are and how they work. Now we can have a long discussion about whether there really is such a thing as scientific thinking, but I think so, and whether scientists do it better than non-scientists, I think so, uh, and whether there are failings that scientists uh, make, uh, I think so. Uh, <laughs> but it does seem to be, historically, the best path to reliable knowledge about how things are and how things work. Now, three quarters of a century ago, and you heard this from Aiden, um, or, well, he referred to this book, Science, the Endless Frontier. Three quarters of a century ago, this book was written toward the end of the Second World War. Now, this was not the book that included my companion essay. I was not quite alive then, but uh, toward the end of the Second World War, Vannevar Bush wrote what became the landmark statement of science policy in the United States. He was an engineer from MIT and science advisor to President Franklin Roosevelt. Vannevar Bush said, U.S. taxpayers and corporate investors should support scientists to do their chosen research because it would meet American material needs. Vannevar Bush and the president wanted to continue into peacetime the extraordinarily productive science and technology enterprise that had won the war for the Allies. He recognized that research had provided, in fact, he not only recognized it, he headed up the programs that provided radar and proximity fuses for bombs and population scale penicillin, the fission bomb, and much more. Bush was sure that research done in universities and some in industries would result in medicines, materials, and munitions for the country. He wrote in his report, Science, the Endless Frontier, quote, without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other directions can ensure our health, prosperity, and security as a nation in the modern world, end quote. Science was king, especially physics. Government and corporate money followed in large amounts. Now, even as researchers have always argued that research funding is not enough, that it could be doubled productively, and I think that's true, they still have to admit that the funding has been large. And this is the result of the promise that Vannevar Bush and others made that public investment in science will provide material benefits. Now in a few moments, I'll say more about non-material benefits that Bush and succeeding generations of scientists 
generally overlooked. But first, let's ask, why do people favor science? Why do people find scientists trustworthy? They do. Let me refer to a personal example. In my first campaign for Congress, and knowing of the streak of anti-intellectualism in American society, I didn't talk much about having a PhD. But within a couple of weeks of campaigning, it became clear to me that being a physicist was a plus with my constituency. Almost everywhere I went to campaign, I was identified as the PhD physicist who is running for Congress. So I began to refer to my scientific background not, and not downplay it, hence the bumper sticker. In opinion surveys that have been repeated over the past half century, people consistently respond with respect for scientists. Well over 50%, 60 70%. No other professional group, except sometimes the military, is regarded with such favor. It's a complicated matter of what they think they see in scientists, whether they really respect us or just say they do. But suffice it to say that there seems to be strong support. Now, in the years of COVID, that trust rating has declined a little bit for scientists in general. And some doubts have surfaced about the trustworthiness of scientists to be willing to go against the opinions of their funders. But overall, scientists apparently have high approval. Now, it's unfortunate that scientists do not usually use this high approval as an opportunity to invite non-scientists into the exciting world of science. And instead, scientists tend to say, in effect, you really can't understand what I do. In fact, you couldn't understand what I do. Just trust me and let us get to it. Now, I don't think the public approval comes from a good understanding among the public of how scientists approach problems what I call thinking like a scientist, even though I do think that's the most important attribute of scientists. No doubt, and most likely, people value the material things that they see coming from science, the gadgets, the medical cures, the convenience of, conveniences of life. Physics research, for example, has led to a number of remarkable uses. You know, X-ray crystallography, led 50 years ago to CCT scans in your hospital. The nuclear magnetic resonance, which was developed to understand the shape of the nucleus, I mean, how more esoteric can you get than that, gave rise to the very practical NMR imaging of human illnesses and injuries. And perhaps indirectly, pattern recognition of materials and um, astronomical objects is used to recognize malformed blood cells and algorithms to study such things as extremely fast atomic processes are applied on Wall Street to lightning fast stock trading. The list of applications of physics is nearly en endless. Um, you no doubt will encounter these in your career and others. One admirable career path for you is applied physics. But even if you do theoretical physics, not really applied, by the way, these distinctions of, 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 of applied and basic and development are, are fuzzy and misleading, but that's the topic for another day. I hope you will find ways to apply your physics publicly. Perhaps you are on that path now. I was disappointed to read this week the comments of Nobel, the recent Nobel laureate Anton Zellinger. He said, addressing people like you, addressing students, he said, do what you find interesting and don't worry about possible applications. 
he seems to me to be saying interesting and applicable are independent variables, maybe even orthogonal, maybe contra contrary or, or, or exclusionary. And I'm not sure whether I would call his statement fallacious or unfortunate or misleading. Uh, and it's you know a little awkward to criticize a recent Nobel Prize winner. Uh, but he seems to be making a descriptive distinction among basic research, applied research, and development. Do you think impractical research is more satisfying than research with practical applications? Do you think it's more important, more ethical? Now, of course, each of us has personal preferences about our day-to-day -day research work. We should consider the pleasure, the inspiration, the aesthetic beauty, that we find in it. Um, and there may be personal ethics. You know, you probably will want to consider who pays for your research and where does the money come from and how are the results used to benefit or to harm others. But those considerations are another matter from whether doing what you find interesting excludes doing work with possible applications. Don't you think so? Applied research need not be in a subfield of physics, working on how physics is applied in various other parts of our society can be important and rewarding. The public does value expertise that it sees in scientists, even when they're working outside of specific physics domains. We live in a complicated technological world, in international affairs, environmental protection, other areas, there are many rewarding possibilities. One campaign brochure I used in my first or maybe second campaign, I don't remember, I used a brochure that showed news of nuclear weapon rivalry between India and Pakistan and asked if citizens wouldn't like to have someone in Congress like me who knows the workings of nuclear weapons and has a Q clearance. I think it was an effective brochure. Scientific experts are generally well regarded. Interesting though, they're not closely examined. The public is very willing to give authority without review to scientists and to experts who interpret science for regulating food and medicines and transportation and other parts of their lives. It's interesting, they are not so willing to give up control of their lives in a lot of other areas, but they seem willing to do that for scientific experts, up to a point. Now Congress also is quick to give enormous authority to expert scientists because even if members of Congress do not fully trust the scientists, they don't think they, as lawyers and business people and whatever they are, know enough to oversee the experts. There really is a chasm between scientists and the public. And I include members of Congress with the public that they represent. The public thinks they cannot understand science and wouldn't want to understand it, and scientists are generally happy to keep it that way. It may be something more that people see in science beyond the producers of inventions and interpreters of complex hydrology or toxicology or combustion or whatever. The public and their representatives seem to believe or want to believe that scientists are objective and truthful, less parochial, have a broader and longer term perspective, and invariably are smart, very smart. In Congress, I was seen by my colleagues as the scientist. Uh, you heard that after I'd been there for a while, Bill Foster joined me, but um, I was a little uncomfortable by that, about that, being called the scientist, because I wasn't the only scientist on the floor, um, although the number of scientists was very small, could be counted on one or two hands. 
they called me the scientist with a sort of respect, but also with a sense of separation. Sometimes when they introduced me to a friend or someone, they'd say, oh, Rush is very smart. I could never understand science. Now, these are very smart people. And it always bothered me. It's nice to be called smart, but the fact is there were many in Congress smarter than I. And the fact is science is not beyond the understanding of members of Congress any more than is economics or history or law. The non-scientific public fails to see that it's the scientific way of thinking that is so special, not the scientists themselves, not their personal values that lead scientists to seek objective viewpoints and to avoid parochial views. Scientists are not naturally more truthful than others, but they've bought into a professional understanding that they will ground their findings in empirical observations and will present their ideas openly for critique. That's part of the bargain you're entering here. The public doesn't realize that the collective scientific enterprise actually makes it possible for even not very smart people to discover things that makes them look very smart. And you and I should help the public understand that. It's nice to, to say, well, to set yourself apart. But we've created a chasm here that is hurting our society by setting ourselves apart. A person doesn't have to be a professional expert to have an adequate understanding of science any more than a person has to be a professional novelist to appreciate language. Or a person has to be a professional statistician to appreciate baseball strategy. The person on the street doesn't have to know the physics of ocean convection or the plasticity of glaciers to understand climate change, or, or more correctly, to know enough to ask the right questions about climate change. Scientists feel like, well, we like to feel important. And we sometimes, one way or another, the way we give our physics talks, say, well, let me see if I can make this intelligible to even you. Uh, it really, keeps, it really creates a distance between the scientists and the public. And they come away thinking, they'll never understand this complicated work, but we'd better trust the scientists. Sometimes the public will trust, and sometimes they will abrupt, abruptly retract their trust, as with COVID vaccines. I've spent much of my time, much of my career, trying to show people that they don't have to give blind trust. They can know for themselves whether to trust what the scientists are saying. They can ask for evidence. They can make judgments about whether scientists have made a good effort to eliminate bias in their studies. They certainly think that they're quite capable of determining whether a business person has eliminated bias in what that person's doing, why can't they similarly make a judgment about whether scientists have made a good faith effort to remove bias from their experiments and their pronouncements? They can ask for evidence. A decade ago, a citizens group in the UK started a campaign with the slogan, ask for evidence. As the head of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, I initiated a similar movement. I would still like to see it catch on broadly. Ask for evidence. Now, the congressional comfort level with science is not high. In Congress, I chose not to be on the science committee because it was clear to me that members of Congress so seldom think about science that the science that is embedded in almost every issue goes unnoticed and unconsidered. It's not the non, it's, it, it is the non-science committees that need a scientist most to identify places where science could inform the issues. 
But if a topic is not explicitly scientific, science often will not find its way into the hearings or into the legislation. A personal example. Well, actually, it's a very public example, but after the 2000 presidential election, this was the Bush-Gore, the Florida um, controversy that you won't remember, but um, involved hanging chads. <laughs> Whether dimples on a paper ballot really represented what the voter was trying to do to punch out the disc on the paper ballot, or whether it was a, whether the voter changed her mind, or whether this wasn't a dimple at all. Um, and so Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, which among other things encouraged states and counties to buy totally electronic voting machines that were totally unauditable. Congress had forgotten to consult computer scientists. And members of Congress didn't think they needed to consult computer scientists because they didn't see any science in this issue. And even when some of us pointed out the problems with auditability, my colleagues either didn't understand or just didn't want to fix the law. And now, in recent years, as you know, We've had a crisis of election auditability. And my former colleagues, one of them actually went public and said, you know, Rush Holt was right back then. <laughs> Another example, 30 years ago, Congress abolished the Office of Technology Assessment, which helped Congress consider technical things like, oh, international partnerships for large science projects or synthetic fuels for transportation, or the possibilities and limitations of artificial intelligence, or vaccines, or nuclear weapons proliferation, things that members of Congress are not comfortable dealing with. And to this day, Congress, the, Congress has not restored the Office of Technology Assessment, um, despite efforts by me and others. The representatives I would say, are so uncomfortable thinking about science that they're not eager to know what they don't know. Now, in this talk, I'm asking you to consider throughout your career, whatever you go on to do, to apply some of your physics, that learning, that thing that remains after you've forgotten everything you were taught in class, your physics-trained thinking to public issues. Now, let me get to the most important thing you can do. America and much of the world faces a crisis involving evidence, specifically the lack of evidence, the neglect of evidence. We're awash in a sea of unmoored opinions. People refuse to seek evidence even for things they care about. If democratic government is going to be just a contest of ungrounded opinions, each asserted more strongly than the next, or maybe more deceptively than the next, then our democracy cannot survive. It's that serious. Empirical evidence about how things are and how things work should be the basis for any effort to realize one's hopes, dreams, and vision for the future, public or personal. Policies on public issues should be grounded in empirical evidence, whether the matter is economics or health or education or war and peace. Yet what passes for evidence-based evidence debate on issues is too often wishful thinking, asserted opinions, or tribal shibboleths. Policymakers and the public appear to think the technicalities are just too much for them. They fail to ask for evidence. Now, when I, when I talk about bringing science to bear, I'm not dismissing or disparaging faith or aesthetics or other personal matters, but for any public 
question. Empirical evidence is what you want to start with. And let me return for a moment to the anecdote of teenage Einstein running with his mirror. I think there are a lot of things in this story. In his Gedanken experiment, he realized, after years of thinking about it, that if he ran at the speed of light, and if the speed of light was changed by the motion of the source, then the electric and magnetic fields of Maxwell would be stationary and could not generate each other's undulating propagation through space. If he ran faster than the speed of light, the event of light hitting the mirror could not occur. Simultaneity may depend on the relative speed of the observers, but Einstein realized that whether or not an event occurs can't depend on the relative motion of the observers. You can't have an event not occur just because one of the observers was moving. If, well, so he reasoned that the speed of light must be the same in all frames, and special relativity followed. Now, I love the anecdote for a number of reasons. Number one, anecdotes are the easiest kind of communication. They grab the listener better than charts and graphs and prose. Tell a story. Two, persistence is necessary in science. I mean, Einstein, I mean, he, yeah, he started at age 16 thinking about this problem, but it was 10 solid years that he worked on just that simple question. Three, even the most sophisticated ideas of science usually boil down to a fairly simple question. Four, if the possible answers are considered critically and empirically from every angle, then an answer can be obtained and accepted, however counterintuitive it may be. And five, most important, you can understand things if you find the right angle. Einstein believed the world is comprehensible. This gets back to my whole point about evidence, about whether you're going to face the questions, the problems you have in life by asking, what is the evidence? How can I find out what the state is? Or whether I'm just going to assert my opinion. It's an important point, and it's not obvious that Einstein said in effect, you can make sense of things. You can understand how things work. He once said, the eternal mystery of the universe is its comprehensibility. His words are sometimes rephrased to say, the most incomprehensible thing in the universe is its comprehensibility. That's one of the wisest and most important things he said. And he did actually say it. There are a lot of things attributed to him and Abraham Lincoln, and Barnum, and <laughs> um, uh, Wozniak, or somebody, that didn't actually happen. But he actually said that. Uh, Steven Weinberg, according to Preskill's obituary of Weinberg, mused about how astonishing it is that the so-called theorists' squiggles on a paper align with physical reality. I think almost all physicists have developed this way of thinking. There is a reality to be understood. Maybe not this year, maybe next. But there is comprehensibility. One need not invoke magic. Nowadays, magical thinking or wishful thinking has escaped the video screen and is affecting public policy and people's lives. And you, and I do mean you, can help people put the magical thinking back into fiction stories and out of public policy. The best example I can give in recent days is vaccination for COVID. You'll say, well, that's not a physics example. Well, it's an example that your physics training has something to say about. One of the more, I mean, of the more than one million COVID-related deaths, think about it, one million 
COVID-related deaths, probably half to three quarters need not have happened. Scientists developed various vaccines that are available, and after millions of jabs, they are known to be very safe. They even seem to reduce, in some people, the risk of the troublesome long COVID. However, rather than seeking evidence about saving their lives and others, people spout unsupported theories, wild conspiracies, advice from uninformed partisan politicians. Even the group of people who seem level-headed and non-conspiratorial quote findings about adjuvants or bad reactions. But if you examine what they're saying, their numbers are far off and their fears are far out of proportion. The death toll should make clear the importance of this. But what can I do about a medical problem, you may ask? I'm a physicist or even a physicist in training. Well, physics is exhibit A, the best example in history of the amazing success of evidence-based thinking, of collecting evidence that is tied to the scientific efforts to ensure that bias has been removed from the observations and that the conclusions are communally verified the amazing success of thinking like a scientist, thinking like a physicist. And you can demonstrate that thinking like a scientist is the best, best path, this is demonstrably true, to reliable knowledge. And that the way of thinking, this way of thinking, is available not only to technical experts. Anyone can ask for evidence. I've now I've been talking about vaccinations, but there are countless other issues, climate change, crime and incarceration, migration, you name it, where we need a return to evidence-based thinking. For medical or any other public question, anyone can ask for evidence to obtain the reliable knowledge on which to apply one's values and hopes. Yes, you can teach that, and it can be world-changing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. I'd like to take questions, okay? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful talk. Awesome. So, uh, what we're going to do, we'll have two people with microphones in the audience, and we'll take uh, turns with questions. So, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh oh. Yeah, I, I, I do indeed want to hear from you because I have a lot of questions about my own talk. There, there's, there's some soft spots in my arguments. Let's see if you catch them. <laughs> um, okay. uh, all right. Um, as you've discussed, in politics, science has become polarized and undervalued, which uh, um, causes people to be set in preconceived beliefs, um, despite science being dynamic. Um, how do you, as a scientist in politics, um, when talking to people, help um, negotiate these biases with your scientific rationale and understanding to come to a common understanding? Um, I, I, rephrase the question part of that, please, just so I'm, I'm clear of what you're asking. Or, or say it again. You don't have to rephrase it. Yeah. So. <laughs> How do you talk to people to help them understand the science that you're trying to say when they have preconceived notions about science. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's the usual problem of, of teaching. Um, <laughs> Jane Austen said, we, we can only teach that which is not worth knowing. Uh, <laughs> what really counts, the other person has to learn. You can't teach it. Um, politicians usually like to assert things. Actually, more often, what they like to do is figure out what the other person is thinking and then repeat it to them. But if you're really trying to present a new idea to someone, uh, it's, the, it's the usual problem of teaching. 
you have to show them how they can grasp it for themselves. And particularly when you're trying to get an idea out that they have a bias against because of the tribe they come from, and I use tribe as a very general term. I mean, it could be the political party they come from or the neighborhood in, in Cleveland that they come from. Um, you have to find a way that they will discover this new idea for themselves and realize that it either fits with other higher values that they have or that it is so important they're going to have to rethink what their tribal shibboleths are. Um, it's not easy. The, the, the bigger the bias, the bigger the uh, um, uh, preconceptions that they have, the harder it is. But we know from experience it can be done. Carl Sagan used to say, the remarkable thing about scientists is that they can actually change their mind. It's not always true. It happens slowly. As some other observers have said, science changes, understanding in science changes one funeral at a time. <laughs> you know, as the old generation passes on and new people are willing to accept the ideas. But the point is, under some circumstances, you can show that the scientific way of thinking um, accepts tentativeness, accepts um, s statistical likelihood, and can make it easier to change from what you thought. There's no simple way to do it, but what teachers do is observe this. You know, to try to teach somebody that the speed of light is the same in all frames can either be asserted and people won't really buy it and they won't get it, um, or you can find some clever way to lead them to realizing that the bias they've been living with, the classical bias they've been living with all their life, doesn't work. Experimentally, it doesn't work. And they're willing, finally, to take a new approach. That applies to any kind of teaching or any effort to get people to uh, embrace an idea. Brad. Hello, um, my name's Jocelyn. I was curious about how you kept like a positive perspective because you know nowadays things are very divided and like you were saying things are less evidence based so when you go into you know congress and all that stuff and people you know are less receptive or appear to disregard you know this type of thinking how do you keep moving forward with that resistance yeah um you know, I suppose one's temperament of being optimistic or pe pessimistic is more or less independent of the facts. <laughs> and fortunately, I'm optimistic. <laughs> um, but I would also say that, um, particularly with members of Congress, uh, I like to look at the possibilities. Uh, and the possibilities of change. I, I must, I, I think I must admit that since I left Congress, um, things have gotten worse. It's not because I left Congress. <laughs> um, you know, I decided not to run for re-election in 2014 after 16 years in Congress, um, just because it seemed to me there comes a time. And um, it, I thought, was the right time. Um, a lot of people since then have said, aren't you glad you're not there anymore? Uh, they don't follow evidence. They have harebrained theories. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious atmosphere. And I have to admit that some of that's true, but I, don't, I just made the decision to retire. Um, 
and it wasn't to escape what was happening in Congress, and it doesn't lead to looking back at it uh, with um, either relief or disdain. I've just moved on. But as I look at society at large, I think this problem of neglect of science, or re I mean, uh, well, neglect of science or rejection of evidence, um, empirical evidence, has gotten worse. It's been growing for decades, so it's not entirely new. But I do think it's getting worse, which is why I'm making a stronger appeal than ever to you. Um, you actually have more influence than you may think. I was wondering, how can you, as an individual, help people understand that they may be using evidence that is clearly biased, or interpreted incorrectly, or just missing context as extremely important? Yeah. Um, I, I, what I try to do, uh, with you know, limited success probably, but is first try to establish uh, what bias is with some examples that affect them uh, where they might be on the wrong side of the bias and hadn't really thought about it that way so that they can understand what bias is and why science has set up these systems, really, these, this um, way of removing as much, much of the bias, uh, so that they can get it that way. Um, I mean, most people learn by analogy and anecdote, uh, and so uh, you should use that. Um, as, as I mention this to you, I'm, I, I'm reminded of the words of, of the um, author and, and physician, um, Lewis Thomas who once, when asked about science, he said, it's the shrewdest maneuver ever invented for understanding how things work. And I love that phrase. There is this maneuver that science has developed over the centuries for recognizing and removing bias from your Exper experimental devices, from your journal writing, from your um, uh, analysis. Um, the shrewdest maneuver. It's not that there's something sacrosanct about science. It's not some holy canon, but rather it is a very clever idea that works. Yeah. Hello, Rush. Oh, hi, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been informed there's about 1,200 young blooming physicists at this meeting. And I wonder about a following question that I've been meaning to ask you for decades, so I'm going to do it here. As we know, um, our principal rival into the next few decades will be China. And one of the features that's very noticeable about the Chinese government is the inclusion at a much greater scale of people with technical backgrounds into the government. And so my question is, which I want you to answer for this audience, is do you think that our government would be better served if more of them followed the path that you trod, namely a scientist who decides to go into government and make a difference? Uh, yes, but it is not to do science in government. Yes, I'm happy to see more technical expertise available to members of Congress, but that by itself isn't enough 
just like developing great vaccines is not enough if people won't take it. So what Congress needs is not so much more experts, but more people who can help them understand what they don't know and understand why it's important for them to know that and get it. And it doesn't have to be the person on staff who is the trained expert herself. It can be that person on staff who just helps them get the technical knowledge they need when it needs to be technical. Most of the time, they don't have to have the technical knowledge themselves, and certainly not the capability to generate that technical knowledge themselves. Um, so the Congressional Fellows Program is good because these are PhD level scientists who are embedded in staff. Many of the, some of the offices use them just to do science related problems, but there aren't many of those. There aren't many things that come across a member's desk that has differential equations or discrete mathematics. Or, but there is every day one or may, maybe many more issues that come across the desk that require thinking like a scientist. And so these scientists are embedded in the office. When I was a science fellow, boy, I remember doing one thing about trying to detect asbestos particles with light scattering for some regulatory matter. Other than that, I can't think of anything I did that would be called science. Um, but I think I contributed to the office a lot by interpreting science, by pointing out where science was involved or might be involved, and by pointing out why this might be a case where you'd like to ask a question so it can be answered empirically and verifiably. Um, there are many ways to do this. You don't have to make it your career. I was, you know, I, 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 when I talked about Mike Casper, my professor at Carleton, who told me about these scientists who were doing arms control, most of them who were doing arms control, like Hans Bethe, the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, weren't doing it full time. They were, I mean, he was discovering neutrino oscillations at the time. Uh, but he also realized that both as a citizen and as a citizen that ha who had, um, well, some special abilities, he had an obligation, an even greater obligation than average, to be involved in the democratic government. Um, and so you don't have to convert your life to public policy or elective office, but it's not a bad idea either. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for talking to us today. It's really important to get us all engaged in uh, science policy. Uh, a question that I have for you is, how do you, as a scientist, as a physicist, and as a politician, uh, engage in debate with someone who may be arguing from a place of obstinance or even arguing in bad faith? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, of course, one of the most frustrating in the things in the world is to encounter intentional ignorance. Um, or belligerent ignorance, um, and it's hard to deal with. Uh, sometimes you just have to walk away. Um, and um, you know, I and and I've lost my cool too many times. I think uh, so. I'm probably the wrong person to to answer that. Um, the um, um, it, it's, you know, I, you have to figure out kind of where they're coming from and kind of get behind that. Um, what do they care about, really? They're 
you know, when they're saying these things, what are they really saying? What is it that they really care about um, when they're pretending not to care about the truth? Um, and, and then work, you know, work it from the back door. But, I, you know, I, I'm not a, you know, I, I don't have a great track record in that, so I can't give you good advice. Hello. Um, Hi. The question that I have for you is, well, there's a lot of religious organizations in America that um, paint science as this evil anti-religious practice and oppose it on a religious basis, which often leads to people being afraid of education, being afraid of science, and a lot of the times I find that some politicians, when they are trying to find some credibility for saying things that are not evidence-based, um, come at it from like a religious standpoint, like I, this is the Christian thing to do, this is like trying to give themselves some ground to stand upon. And sometimes when you talk to people who have been influenced by this sort of somewhat predatory, like anti-science agenda, they feel as if you are attacking their religion when trying to talk about science and evidence-based stuff. Um, how would you advise like education from people who think that science is an affront to their religion? Yeah, and, and, and you can broaden that to something, you know, science that's an affront to your politics, too. Um, politics have become so partisan and divided that, to some extent, the parties have become like religions. Um, you know, I, I, I hope you noticed when I said along the way I'm not dismissing or disparaging um, aesthetics or faith or personal uh, things that are important to you personally. But when you're talking about um, public matters, you know, this is a, a democratic society where everyone in the society is supposed to have equal rights. We try to give we try to achieve equal opportunity, and we try to achieve equal treatment. Um, then, um, then you're dealing with things that are empirical, and that's where science comes in. And you have to find a way to make it clear to people that you're not trying to take away their personal beliefs. Um, now, of course, this is tricky. When you get to vaccination, somebody says, well, my religion won't allow it, or I have a personal belief. You got to tell them that if you don't get vaccinating, vaccinated, you're putting other people at risk. You're, help, you're working to unravel this society. And society has an obligation to protect itself you know, as fairly as possible. And um, so, um, you know, I think that's the approach you have to do. It's really unfortunate that science has been politicized. politicized. Uh, it's really unfortunate that um, religious organizations have turned anti-science more in the last few decades um, on, on matters of evolution, abortion, other issues, if you look back 40, 60, 70 years, most religions took a live and let live approach where they would like to have the freedom to practice and think the way they choose, uh, but not to try to enforce their religion on other people. Um, but I've seen over the decades a change. Similarly in partisan politics, 
there have been differences between you know free market and and statists and uh, any number of other divisions in politics, but it hasn't been quite uh, quite uh, you know it hasn't been a fundamentalist uh, approach so much. I'm not sure how we got there, and I'm not sure how we get out of it. Um, but it's not healthy. Time for two more questions. Um, so. Uh, some things you were talking about earlier include um, like uh, using physics and evidence-based thinking as a tool to navigate social and cultural problems as well as um, the idea that physics is not necessarily a canon, it's more of um, a logical way of thinking and like uh, yeah. using that as outreach to the non-scientific community. However, my question you, you is... You got it well. Good summary. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. My question is, like, what about, uh, instead of communication to the outside community, what about communication inside of our community? How can we uh, be sure that we are not treating <laughs> science as a canon and that people yeah, with different yeah. lived experiences yeah. might not be as um, close to canon, but their lived experiences and perspectives on social issues and using physics as a, so, as a social tool is not any less logical, just different yeah. from the canon. Uh, <laughs> great question. And um, well, I, my guess is you're already finding ways, just the fact that you asked that question makes me think you're finding ways uh, to do this. I mean, you really want to guard against becoming closed-minded yourself. Um, and when I say apply physics thinking, I'm certainly not saying that uh, social science, and I do think there is social science. Some people re reject that and say, oh, that's just politics. So there is no social science. I think there is. You know, when Vannevar Bush wrote his study which resulted in the creation of the National Science Foundation and things like that. The National Science Foundation did not fund social science research. For years, there was no division within the National Academy of Sciences to deal with social, psychological um, sciences. And um, there should be. Not that social sciences is as, um, uh, can be reduced to uh, equations the way Newtonian mechanics can be. Uh, and some people will say, well, you know, we can't, uh, it, it can't be a science because we can't come up with universal laws in the same way. Well, you don't have to have universal laws to have a science. You do look, for some generality uh, that affects reactions, but that applies to reactions between people as well as between particles in an, acceler an accelerator. The, well, what kinds of general rules are there that govern those interactions? And um, the um, uh, you know, and if you have enough diversity in the way you practice the science. And this is where, you know, the whole Jedi movement, the justice, equity, diversity, inclusion idea is, is not just a matter of fairness or humane treatment. It is those things. There are just basic ethical reasons why we should do a better job. Um, but there are also reasons that it helps you if you have a more diverse practice, uh, you're more likely to, to see your own blind spots, see um, bias in the way you're approaching a problem. Not necessarily bias against people, but by having diverse people there, you're more likely to see the bias that you're introducing um, you know, in the physics experiment. Uh, diversity, helps you kind of put things in perspective that, that you need for, well, in order to apply 
what I was talking about applying in society at large, in public issues and public problems. Okay. This is Hi. great to hear from you. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. You spoke from your own experience about the importance of scientists and scientific thinking in, uh, for lack of a better word, infiltrating <laughs> government and policy <laughs> spaces. And as someone with a physics background working in science policy, that really resonates with me. But maybe for, I don't know, the majority of people in this room who are considering going into academic or research careers, do you have advice for scientists about how to invite policymakers into our science community? Yeah. Um, I, pref I like the word integrated into rather than infiltrated. <laughs> um, I, sure. I, you know, I mean, one, one approach is, you know, the science fellows in the various government agencies and on Capitol Hill. Uh, to integrate the science into the day-to-day -day workings of and decision making in the audience in the office, but uh, there, uh, you know, there are a lot of other ways. I think, um, you know, if you're kind of, I, I, I'm hoping that everybody here uh, will at least drop in and drop out of of public policy of public questions, of societal issues, uh, and bring some clear thinking to those public issues. Whether or not you make a career of it, whether you're going to be in science policy. And by the way, you know, science policy can mean policy for science, like what's the budget going to be for NASA this year, uh, and science for policy. I'm talking more about that second, how science and the scientific way of thinking can inform the policy making and the regulatory activities and so forth. But uh, even if you don't do that professionally full time, there are countless ways you can do the other. You've got to make sure that, well, whether you're embedded or an integrated there, or whether you are uh, just uh, offering um, a, a, a scientific advice, um, that you do it constructively and not talk down. So many people want to talk not about what you learn from science in general, but what your experiment is. Let me tell you about my experiment and why it's worth funding and what it has to say about the health and well-being of of Americans into the future. Uh, that doesn't get you too far. Uh, and it also, as I mentioned in the talk, it doesn't get you too far when you talk down to the non-science people that you are trying to assist. Um, you know, let me, let me see if I can explain it so simply that even you can understand it. Um, that's very off-putting. <laughs> but if you listen to even very artful um, science lecturers, that's often what they're saying. That's the subtext. And that doesn't get you very far. So, you know, uh, it, there, there, there's no more single or simple answer to your question than to a lot of these other questions. It's a good question, and you know, all I can say is there are ways to do it. And you have to find for yourself what works, but there are models out there that you can observe. Yeah, for sure, thanks. Let's, give a, let's give him a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we have a small token. So, Congressman Holt, on behalf of the Society of Physics Students and Sigma Pi Sigma, I'd like to thank you for your time and expertise in sharing that with us today. And so we have a little gift basket for you, including the honorary mascot of the Society of Physics Students, a spherical cow plushie. So. <laughs>
Thank you, Aidan. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, Brad. And so that was amazing. I never thought I would hear a talk by Rush Holt in person, so I'm so excited. And we have a couple of surprises. Who likes surprises? Anybody? So nobody likes surprises? A couple of surprises, real quick ones, we like that? Okay. So what I'd like to first do is I'd like to invite uh, Earl to come on up to the stage. Uh, he is the award winner from 2019 for the Worth Segan Dollar Award. So I have the, the pleasure of describing briefly to you the award that we're about to present here. Worth Segan Dollar was an instrumental person early in the life of the Society of Physics Students when it was formed in 1968, holding numerous leadership roles and advocacy roles in, in making it forward. He also mesmerized the 2004 Physics Congress with his stories of his experience as a young scientist working at Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project. There's some awesome uh, recordings and transcripts on the Sigma Pi Sigma website. The Worth Siegendaler Award was first presented to Worth Siegendaler in recognition of his great service to Sigma Pi Sigma. It is an award that recognizes someone who has worked not only at a local or zone level, but at a national level to promote and enhance the society of Sigma Pi Sigma as a whole. And now to uh, assist me, okay. let me make sure I'm getting this right. Yeah. Got to make sure I'm getting all of the right things going. Oh, here we go. It's really fancy. Yes. It's like a big metal. It weighs like two pounds. This is an awesome metal. I'm, this is the original Worth Segan Dollar medal because it's the one that was presented to Worth and his family returned it to Sigma Pi Sigma after he passed away. And I'm very disappointed that I left mine at home because you don't have many excuses to wear this. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would like to invite Gary White to come to the podium to present the Worth Segan Dollar Award to our next Thank you, Earl. Um, I always felt a kinship to the awardee today um, because we both came from small town Louisiana. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, I, Willie Rocker went to Grambling University and chose Grambling partly because of its reputation, but also partly because of his aspiration to play sports there. And I had the same aspiration for a small, small college town in Louisiana also. Um, but later, uh, I didn't know Willie at that time, um, but later he came to the SPS Council um, when I was serving as SPS director. And uh, he was a remarkable addition to the council, participating in everything, and uh, always bringing students to the front. Um, uh, I was very impressed in general. We'd go to various member society meetings or SPS meetings, and there'd be a crew from Moore, Morehouse College always there uh, doing well. And then uh, more recently, uh, Willie has gone beyond that and serving as Sigma Pi Sigma president, uh, being awarded the Outstanding Chapter Advisor Award for SPS, and also serving as the president of NSVP. So for all these reasons, um, I think is why he was selected for the Worth Seeking Dollar Award. So let's welcome Willie Rockward. So this is a surprise for Willie. I got you. I got you. And just so you know, uh, Gary got Willie into the society and active in SPS, and that's why I had Gary make the remarks. And then I did want to, before you get a chance, 
I want to invite one of our plenary speakers to add a couple remarks themselves. Um, it is truly an honor to be able to stand here uh, with him on the stage. He, he followed me as NSBP president, but when he came on, um, the respect that I got from him as a colleague and a peer in the field was amazing. He's always referred to me as Madam President, even though I'm no longer in the office. But to be in an area where we struggle sometimes to treat all of us with respect, I never got that from Willie. He is a man of integrity and honor. And it is truly an honor to see him today with you guys here to be able to honor him as well. He deserves everything and more. Congratulations. You can fit over my big head. It fits over your big head. You want to say anything? I got to say something. You don't have to. You don't have to. Say I'll take my glasses off so I can't see you. <laughs> um, I'm not one for surprises, but I love to do them on other people. Uh, they set me up very well. Um, I just knew I was supposed to give Gary some talks about Gary because he was the one that introduced me and got me really involved into SPS and Sigma Pi Sigma. And, uh, and Brad has played it along all the way here, here's some more notes about Gary and things like that. So I'm at, at the table getting ready to, and, uh, <laughs> um, but one thing I am, I'm never short on words. I can tell you that much. Um, but I, I'm grateful, uh, Renee, uh, you know, I realize that mentoring is, um, is my lifeline. Okay, I, I, it's just, it's in my blood. It's in my genetics, uh, it's just in my spirit. And I believe in mentoring any and everyone, but I also believe in being mentored. And those who you see up on this stage have mentored me in every area in my um, life here at SPS and, and in physics in many different ways. And there are other mentors in this room too. Um, I didn't, ex I didn't, I didn't expect to receive an award. I don't, I don't do things for awards. I do things because it's the right thing to do, to help others because somebody helped me. Uh, in my physics, I didn't understand things, and um, somebody sat down with me. They didn't look like me. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them was male, some of them was female. But they helped me. That's what matters. They helped me get through my, my, my stumbling block, my uh, wall, they, they help me, and I, I believe that's what I'm supposed to do, is to help others, to help my students. I tell my students at Morgan State now, I tell them, I say, you are my academic sons and daughters. Uh, and I'm gonna be there with you all the way, and, and, and it doesn't matter um, how long I be there or whatever, what matters is that we started the relationship. And I can be a, over in Russia, <laughs> I hope not, but you know. <laughs> If I am, doesn't mean that it takes away from my relationship. And the same with you in SPS. You may not know this. And, well, I've said this when I, when, when I had a chance to serve as president for Sigma Pi Sigma. And it's one I believe, it's a, it's a slogan I still believe today. Physics is for everyone. Because everyone does physics. Thank you very much. Did you know we all just turned 100? I mean, I don't look 100, maybe like 80, but we're 100 now. 
And I would like to, uh, since when you're 100, you can do crazy things, right? So at least that's what like, people keep telling me when they're 100, they can do whatever they want. Um, so the SPS president asked to do what they wanted. So could Kirill please come back up to the stage? Congress, happy birthday, happy 100th birthday. And really, my sincere congratulations. I think you are the embodiment of what a mentor should be for all of us. So again, sincere congratulations. Now, one important point that I would like to uh, state here, that this is a very special award, as Earl described to us, right? And this is a, a award which is given for very special service to the SPS and Sigma by Sigma. And it is typically given well, it's always given once every Physics Congress. So the Physics Congress of 2022, congratulations, our special recipient. However, this year we're turning 100 years old and a special party, a special birthday party, requires special celebration. So Willie, would you mind coming back to the stage here? <laughs> Please. Just explain what is going on here. Willie is going to present another recipient of uh, this wonderful award, Worst Signal Dollar Award. Okay, all right. I get to talk about somebody who, who, were, who, who, um, who was very, very special within my life. Um, probably when I was, when I was a young faculty at uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I started a group pulling things together, a Sigma, you know, uh, SPS group, um, because when I was an undergrad in Louisiana, um, and I told many of you about my story of how I got into physics, um, and it wasn't because I loved it, is that my mom, I was scared of my mama. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but this person, what they did do, they um, encouraged me. I brought a group of uh, physics majors to this um, zone meeting in Alabama, at the University of Alabama. And, 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 and this person, um, our awardee for today, he, he really, he was a guest speaker. And I think he was a director at the time. And he spoke to me and I mean, he just put me on the side and said, okay, now, Willie, man, you're doing some great things. You're young faculty. You're doing the research. But I think if you focus a little bit more on, on, on making sure you mentor the students, you'll be surprised. And I started telling him about what I did when I was an undergrad, how my, my department chair mentored me and poured into me. And he began to start talking to me about the many things we can do. <laughs> this person... He just stayed, I, I, I thought that was the only time I would see him, but he just, you know, he was like a gnat. You know, he just couldn't, couldn't get rid of him. No, no, no. He was, he was a good gnat. He's the one that sit on your shoulder. Um, but, but, you know, he just stayed consistent. I see him and saw him in several different areas and different places. And come to find out, he served in every position, every major position in SPS. Every, I mean, as a, as a chapter advisor, a zone council, well, a chapter advisor for two different chapters, two different zones. Um, on the council, the director, I believe he even put out the trash. For, uh, <laughs> he probably, didn't. knowing his personality, he would. Um, but most of all, he's a great friend, a great mentor, and one who deserves this award, award over and over again. Uh, my good friend, my mentor, Gary White. He also didn't know this was happening. Uh, 
I have very little to say, but um, I'm so honored. Um, I, I was there when Worth Singing Dollar uh, talked about the Manhattan Project uh, in 2004, and it was amazing. Uh, and just describing this sphere of radioactive material that he was having to deal with by himself in, in the nighttime in the lab, I remember that. Uh, it was shocking and, um, and startling and worth listening to again. Uh, and to be uh, awarded this in his name um, is very flattering and humbling. Thank you. So, who wants one more surprise? Is Sandeep here? Sandeep Guri? Sandy, if you want to come up front. Round of applause for Sandy. Okay, I'm glad I didn't leave 15 minutes ago. Um, so this is a great meeting. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I don't know whether you know, but um, um, I'm part of the AIP Foundation. Uh, we created part of the board. Uh, I'm at Google. And uh, just want to share a very 30-second story. Um, I'm going to make an announcement. You know, uh, almost 20 plus years ago, uh, I was uh, in college and kind of struggling financially. I was uh, taking full uh, load classes and working some 35, 40 hours a week, you can imagine, and uh, ready to drop out. And somebody told me, <clears throat> why don't you apply for this SPS scholarship? They have something available. Uh, my advisor, Steve Feller, uh, or Michael. Um, so I ended up applying to that. and. Little did I know, many months later, I received that I got the scholarship. And um, a long story short with that, I was able to pay for my uh, housing and meal plan. And I came up with uh, a plan with the president of the university because I was almost a year and a half behind in fees. And they made a special deal, and I was able to continue and uh, finish my degree. And long story short, went on to uh, PhD, and then now I build products in the industry. But that small uh, gift from SPS actually came at a very pivotal moment. And um, thank you, SPS. And I said to myself quietly back then that um, I'll return the money at some point, just in my head. And uh, many years later, I've been working uh, in the inner workings of Google, trying to make, uh, trying to bring uh, Google into what we are doing here with physics and get them all motivated and why we need more people in hard sciences and why we need more diversity in hard sciences, et cetera. So today I wanna to announce that I'm, through the help of Google, uh, we are gonna return that back to SPS except we'll do it 20 times over. So 20 additional students, I think so, yep. right? We'll get the SPS scholarship next year and it'll be called the Google SPS scholarship. Thank you. Let's give Google a big thank you. And a lot of that, in fact, this is entirely because of Sandeep. So let's thank, let, let's thank Sandeep for this. So thank you, Sandeep, for giving back. Thank you. Well, I don't get to do that every day. I don't even think I'll ever get to do that again. So was that fun? We had a good time? OK. So uh, one last bit of business. Uh, we had some guests for lunch. And so I would appreciate it if the guests could stand up for me, if that's OK, if there's any guests left in the room. So uh, scientists, lunch with scientists, if you don't mind standing up.
Can we get a round of applause for them? So on behalf of SPS and Sigma Pi Sigma, thank you for joining us for lunch today. And you are always welcome. And you are, you are a part of the SPS family, and you are always welcome at SPS. So thank you for joining us. OK, so students, we excited for some workshops? I think it's the best set yet. We're going to have an awesome time today. Uh, Lunch with Scientists, thank you for joining us. Students, I think you know where to go or you can figure out where to go. Um, and then just a little bit of uh, back heap. So we're going to be leaving the room. We're doing workshops. And then I hear tonight is we're dressing up as our favorite physics or astronomy person, concept, or equation, or anything you want. Anybody excited about that? So I'm definitely dressing up. And then we'll have dinner. So we're going to have dinner together over in the other rooms, and then we're going to come back to this room at 7.15, not before, because we have to get set up, and we're going to have the Centennial Festival. So it's going to be a crazy thing. It's going to be like a big carnival atmosphere. It's like make your own cookies, make your own buttons. You can meet Jocelyn Bell Burnell, take the selfie. You can meet Eric Cornell. He's coming back with us. There's going to be a, hunch, hunch, a lot of events to do. We're going to have cupcakes and dessert, and then we're going to do the dance party, which is sponsored by the American Physical Society. So if you didn't bring your dancing shoes, I think a lot of people dance barefoot as well. OK? So students, go to your workshops. Uh, uh, Lunch with Scientists, thank you for joining us. And I will see you all in a little bit.